Welcome to At the Table, a play reading series brought to you by Charging Moose Media. In this episode, we are chatting with the cast of Sparrow Song by Peter Charney. Enjoy! Good morning, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. It's Saturday in various New York locations and outside Atlanta, yeah? At- Terry? Uh, yeah. Atlanta, same That's time right. zone. We are all sitting here on Zoom, and I'm so thrilled to be here today with two of my very favorite performer, mm-hmm. artist, creator friends to read Sparrow Song by Peter Charney. And before we get to all of that, which you've already heard, right? You That's have what I keep screwing up. I hope you point. liked it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope you liked it. We already did it, and you were a fan. Before that, we're going to talk a little bit with these two wonderful humans. So let's start right here with... Miss Terry, if you want to introduce yourself and tell us where you are and how you are. Uh, well, my name is Terry Burrell. I'm here in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm doing actually pretty well. Uh, you know, I'm lucky that I'm not sort of cooped up in an apartment somewhere. I can go out in my backyard and every Friday night at five o'clock, our neighbors meet at the other end of the cul-de-sac. They bring their chairs and some beverage, alcoholic beverage. And we socially distance and we just shoot the shit, you know? It's very oh, nice. That's great. That's lovely. It's very nice. But I've been busy. I've been busy here. And I did a, um, I was the host for a virtual fundraiser that they're going to do tonight for theatrical outfits. So I went in uh, Thursday and I just shot it and shot my pieces. And it was nice to get out and feel like I was doing something normal. You yeah. Know, get into makeup and costume and blah, blah, blah. And, and then I didn't have to contend with rush hour traffic like it usually is here in Atlanta. You know, getting home mm-hmm. is a breeze. So that's how I'm doing. Oh my gosh. I, I'm so glad. How is, um, this feels like a bit of a fraught question and perhaps it should be right at this moment, but how would you describe both with the, you know, current this week's events, but also general pandemic? How, how does Atlanta feel right now? How does it feel to you? Atlanta feels relatively calm. I didn't know until last night when we were watching the news, we were seeing people being very angry and protesting in the streets. I thought it was Minneapolis. And my husband said, where in Atlanta is that? And I said, Atlanta. He said, look, and I see Atlanta, Georgia. And it was downtown near Peachtree. Um, Yeah. People were very, very angry. You know, I I don't personally ascribe to looting and, 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 you know, busting out windows and stealing and that kind of thing. And I think it's a certain type of person that does things like that. But I was reminded of something that Martin Luther King said, and he said that violence is the language of people who are not heard. And I think, you know, what was so outrageous about what what happened here was that on a human level, what we were watching was a snuff film. That's what we were watching. We were watching the act of murder in our very faces. And all I can say is, that's one we saw. How about the ones that we've never seen? Well, all we've ever seen are pictures, you know, pictures of the aftermath. But there are people who live in certain areas that experience that kind of crap every day. And I mean, I've had friends who, were, who are routinely stopped on the streets of New York City because they're driving while Black. People in the business, you know, who pay their taxes and pay their rent on time and all of that. And it, it, is, it, is, it is just astonishing to me that they're not bitter, nasty, vicious people. Maybe it's because of what they, how they express themselves creatively that that helps. But, um, you know, one of the things that I've been doing is taking an online class with my minister and it was called The Art of Uncertainty. And a funny thing happened to me. I found my heart chakra just sort of bursting open and feeling a lot of compassion. You know, uh, some of the people involved in some of the things that have been happening, like this young man that was killed in Brunswick, Georgia, Ahmad Obrey, you know, you, <laughs> but for the act of getting in their truck, you know, and then I saw their mug shots and I thought to myself, these two human beings have no idea what just happened to them. This police officer is sitting there today replaying that, that scenario over and over and over again. You know, I don't even know where he was. It's like he was in a trance. 
kneeling in that man's neck. It was so ugly, you know, and um, all of my, a lot of my friends have been reaching out to me saying, are you okay? I love you. I want to be supportive. And I see a lot of white folks out there in those crowds, just as many white folks as there are black folks. And I think mm -hmm. people are finally getting it that it's, you got to talk to your own. I can't teach white people not to be racist. White people can't teach black folks not to be racist. Can't do it. But this is an opportunity now to when you hear something from a family member, a grandfather, an uncle, an aunt, to stop them, because that's where it takes the courage to say, yeah. that's not right. It's not right. And that's, that has not been my experience. You know, and use your eyes and all of your senses to take a person in. Don't just make a judgment because they look a certain way. That's my spiel. It's a good spiel. Thank you. I hope you don't mind my asking about it. I thank you for being of willing to not. talk about of it. Of course not. Yeah, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we're so not because we're so not conditioned or acculturated as white people to do that. That yeah. one of the privileges is somebody says something from our family or from our friends or you know we hear something and one of the privileges is getting to be like. I'm not going to engage with that, which is, and I think we're uh, now being, you will have I to hope you will have to. And it takes courage to do that. It's not easy. Yeah. It's easier to just say, oh, they're, they're just ignorant and let it go. But, you know, even if they clap back at you, it, it will be something that they will think about. Yeah. Could I on any number of topics create a second podcast where I just listen to you talk on anything? Because I think I would. Um, <laughs> I would listen to it all the time. Like you mentioned about 60 things in there from like intercultural co communication to like heart chakras that I would like to hear you talk for an hour on. Honestly, I would, I would create a podcast that's just coming down to Georgia and listening to you and your neighbors shoot the shit at the end of the cul-de-sac. <laughs> yes. oh, I'm going to call it at the end of the cul-de-sac and it's going to be great. <sighs> <Yes>. <laughs> There's always something going on. Um, I am so, so happy to see your face, Terry, and I am thrilled to get to ask you the only question that uh, we ever remember to ask on this show, so we pretend like it's a bit. Uh, <laughs> is there a food or snack? This feels like a hell of a pivot. Is there a food or a snack, something that's giving you great comfort during this time? Well, you know, we've been eating very well here in Atlanta. <laughs> uh, there is... And I'm, I'm, I'm hope I'm saying the word right, but there's like these rice cakes, not rice cakes. It's like sort of so sort of crispy corn thing that they, it's a Japanese uh, corn, I think it's called mochi. The crispy ones that you can get? Yeah, and they sell it at Trader Joe's. I love yes, those Yes, those are so good. Oh, those they're like so rice good. snacks. Oh, yeah, they're so really good. quite delicious. Quite delicious. Yeah. And, and, and the, we have a grocery store down here called Aldi's and they've got these like these sesame Ooh. flavored uh, pretzels and pretzels are not even something that I'm that particularly fond of, but I like these, you know, they're sort of bite size and they're delicious. That gets me yeah. through the day. And a glass of wine. Just one. Uh, you're, you're better than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a Phenomenal. big one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, so glad. That's phenomenal. Uh, Sam, <laughs> So, Dolly, tell the people who you are and where you are and how you are. Oh, okay. Um, I my name is Sam Tadaldi. I am presently uh in the in the wilds of 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 Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, um, which is decidedly not wild. It's very uh a lot of a lot of prams, a lot of baby strollers. Um, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm I'm very thoughtful about what's what's happening. So I feel especially uh, tongue tied which I think is a nice, you know, it's good to be thoughtful and and to untie my tongue sometimes. So I'm very thoughtful. I'm a little like, uh, my mind is a little jumbly right now. Just what with everything that's happening and has been happening. But other than that, I'm going to pivot. I'm I'm okay. You know, this, this, this time has been, you know, there's lots of people being like, I'm doing amazing things. I'm creating amazing things. I've taken up a new hobby. I have done, uh, I think, none of those things. Um, <laughs> not, a, not a single one. Uh, every no. day around 5 o'clock, I put on real clothes. Wow. Yeah. Um, but uh, I don't know. I'm, my brain is so jumbly right now. 
Um, is this a, is this a, for me, I'm going to pivot real quick. Cause for me, my brain gets jumbly all the time. Is there an action that if we weren't in a quarantine and everyone hiding in their homes inside uh, not ideal situations, is there a, a thing that normally you would turn to, to unjumble your brain? Like, what do you feel like is missing from the de-jumbling process? Oh, that's an interesting question. You know, I honestly don't know. I guess I would, um, I think I would exercise or see a, see a friend maybe more and like get a, get a real sounding board about like, uh, the thoughts that are, that are jumbly, you know, um, yeah. it, in this, in this time, uh, I don't have, I haven't done anything creative. And I think like, I love when people are like, don't, don't stress about not being creative. And I'm like, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Thank you for directing that exactly at me. I needed that. And then, um, but I do feel like uh, a couple of weeks ago, I started making this list that was like things you might want to learn to do. And I, I don't eat gluten. So one of them was like, bake a gluten free bread. And then I thought about it and it was almost as good as having done it. So I was like, good for me. And then I don't know how to braid. So I put on the list, I put um, learn to French braid your hair, exclamation point. And I, uh, didn't do it, and it. I might as well have, um, because I just by making the list, I like. Uh, yeah, list making is an accomplishment, Sam. Maybe that's what I got really good at in this time. I haven't read. I've picked up the same book, which everyone is like, "Oh my god, that book's incredible!" And I've started it and gotten seventy pages into it. Um, yeah, I so I haven't done. Uh, you know, oof. Sorry, guys. Ugh. No, absolutely not. To be very clear, like this is a. <laughs> resonant and comforting because I feel like I'm in the same I'm spending a lot of good time on things that are incredibly unimportant so that's how I'm spending my time you know I like I spent the first part of the crying then I w had to find a job and then when that happened I spent time spending some of the money from that job like putting things on my fire escape so like <laughs> that's how I've spent 10 weeks is like putting things on my fire escape like what plants plants well they're not plants yet they're seeds and dirt but I feel hopeful right now? Well, you you know what? When it all started, the first thought I had was that I wanted to plant vegetables. Because mm -hmm. I kept thinking, I don't know where this is going to go. It's how it's going to affect our food supply, all of that. And then I talked to this yeah. friend of mine who's very metaphysical and very wise. And I told him and he said, well, you know what you're doing when you do that, Terry? And I thought he was going to say something negative. And he said, what you're doing when you do that is that you're saying that you believe in a future. Oh, that got me right in the center of my chest. Yeah. That's, yeah. I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. I think it mm -hmm. feels like extending the metaphor that I've never been good at growing plants. Like I have really, um, I've gotten succulents as presents and had them not succeed um, before. So putting some time into like this basil plant and I got a bird feeder because there are a couple of birds outside that I've think are really cool and want to spend some more time. Rachel, that crow is going to be a real problem. Is one red and one yellow? Hey, good question. <laughs> good question. Oh my God. So I have a cardinal. I do. Ah. I have a, a jerky blue jay. And mm. my favorite favorite, who's around all the time, but doesn't touch the bird feeder yet, is a northern mockingbird, which are like these kind of brownish black birds but they have these beautiful little white marks like right on each wing and they're just so he's so cool I just never knew I was going to be a bird person I'm finding a lot of comfort in the like shrinking of my life right now and like the like the the, the essentialsness so you doing nothing Sam feels like resonant and lovely to me like the the ritual of like when you change your clothes to my mind right now I'm like that must feel like such an accomplishment like that sounds lovely to me it is an accomplishment I'm also like the the birding thing is so interesting because I my friend I have a friend Molly Molly Hager um, she hates birds. Friend of the pod, Molly Hager. Friend of the pod, Molly yeah. Hager. Um, hates birds. And I haven't ever thought about them that much, but I think all the time inside and, and isolated, I heard this bird last week. At first, I was like, someone is being murdered. And I was like, oh, my. And, and I had just and I had just been talking about Rear Window because I'd never seen it. And then I watched it. So it was all like I was very, you know, we had a lot of Hitchcock in my brain. I was like, someone is getting murdered and I can it's very close and I need to figure out where it is. And then I realized it was a bird 
just mm-hmm. the thirstiest bird's mating call being like, somebody! Like, just, like, crying <laughs> into the void, being like, someone, like, copulate with me immediately. And it was, it sounds, I, I have a recording of it, and it sounds desperate. And I'd be, like, watching, I, I'm almost done with The Wire, I have two episodes left, so I'd be, like, deeply invested, and this bird in the middle of the night would be like, like, and just, like, all night trying to get someone to uh, to do the birds and the bees business with it. And it went on for days. And then all of a sudden it was happening during the day. Like, and it was had only been at night. And this poor bird just wanted to, just wanted to do it just so bad. Just wanted some love in. Yeah. yeah. And then mm-hmm. I haven't heard it in a few days. And I got really sad. Well, but maybe he's, you know, maybe he's um, Maybe he busy. succeeded. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he got what he needed. But yeah, now he's gone. He, he just he flew the coop right after he got what he needed. I just thought he was going to be or a closer friend. he's there him. and quiet. Maybe, yeah. Get a bird feeder. <gasps> bird feeder. <laughs> I'm afraid because I saw a raccoon outside. Like, Uh-oh. we were out on the fire escape, and then I saw a, rac- a really big child size. raccoon. They were getting huge. Yeah. We were in the park the other day, and, like, one essentially walked up to us, and it was the size of, like, a huge cat. Just, like... Is it walking its hind legs? It was <laughs> just smoking a cigarette. Uh, yeah. Uh, we were over on, like, 96. We took a walk to Central Park. That was, like, our big... We've been out of the house, like, outside of our... To, uh, you know, we've gone out to take the trash out and things. But in terms of actually leaving our, our block and, and this area, we've been out four times since March 12th. Uh, I uh, I could talk to both of you all day. I really, really could. Oh, Sam, before we move we have, on, though. We have questions. What is the food, snack, meal, anything that's getting you through the, getting you through the quarantine? Um, well, um, I, I'm really lucky. Uh, I'm living across from a Trader Joe's right now. Oh, mm. so, um, so there is a peanut butter yeah. at Trader Joe's and I stand by that it is the best peanut butter to ever exist. And I like never ate peanut butter as a younger person. And then when I found it, maybe like eight years ago, um, I swear someone was like, I did like a reading and they were like, do you want to get a, do, do you want to come with all of us to like get a drink afterwards? And I was like, no, I'm so sorry. I have plans. And it was because I, I went home to eat like a, like a farmer's market, five pound bag of apples with the peanut butt, like, and it, there's like a, I have like a, it's, oh. a, it's, it has, it's squat. It has a red cap and it is a crunchy salted peanut butter with flax and chia seeds. And, um, oh. I have been known to eat the whole thing in a day, which I feel really fine about. Um, yes. except that then there's no more. And the other snack is like, I've never had, <laughs> I'd never had Takis, um, but people love them. Those like spicy sort of corn roll up chippies things but Trader mm-hmm. Joe's has a version but they're a little too spicy for me mouth so sometimes what I do <laughs> is I slide <laughs> I slide like a like a thinly sliced cooling vegetable like maybe a cucumber slice in the middle of this spicy chili lime corn roll-up chip so it like does two things at once and I would say actually now that we're talking mm. about it uh that's that's <laughs> what I've done in quarantine that's a that's an accomplishment. I want to be a hundred percent clear. Yeah, that's I believe called cooking. Yes. Cooking is when you put a vegetable in the middle of the chip so that your little baby uh-huh. tongue doesn't burn. Yeah, <laughs> that's so. correct. No. Before we, that's great. Before we move on, Ned Donovan, is there a food that has shifted for you this week that has really taken uh, pr- pride of place? Uh, no, an old favorite came back this week. Uh, uh, I rediscovered a dear love for toffee and chocolate in a combination. Yeah, Ooh, I bought myself absolutely. a whole bunch of toffee chocolate bars on my last uh, store trip, and I ate all of them yeah. within twelve hours. All right, absolutely. That's what the way I've got intended. Right. I will say, I um, it's a big day at the Sella Sella Flynn house uh, because I made cold brew last night. I took Ooh. my Dunkin' and I made a big, like, carafe of cold coffee for the morning. So I'm having iced coffee for the first time all year because I am a very bad... I'm doing... My side hustle has become... I'm working for a consultancy that does primarily climate justice. And my biggest thing that I'm doing 
to negate that work is I was such a nice coffee person and I'm such a, from New England. So I'm such a dunks person sure. and I would go every day and get those plastic cups of, I knew it was bad. I knew it was bad, but I didn't have the things at home to make the iced coffee and then realize what a dumbass excuse that was. So now I made my, my own dunks iced coffee and it's really, it's so funny how something little like that, like it's changed the whole Saturday. Like my sister called this morning and was like, what's up? And I was like, oh, well, okay. It's pretty exciting. Like that was the whole, I woke up and was like, I'm going to have a nice coffee. <laughs> that was my whole. So it's funny that again, the shrinking, but the, the, the little pleasures have gotten very, very large. So it's cold brew, Ned. It's cold brew. Good. For me, yeah. you know, the, the little pleasures. Tell us why I'm talking this fast. Ra Rachel knows this and you two have only just met me, but, but my coping mechanism for troubled times is make weird art a lot. And mm -hmm. I just make things. Mm. And, you know, I haven't, At the Table has been taking off in a very exciting way. We found a lot of new listeners. Hi to all of you out there. And uh, one of my other shows uh, just got shouted out on a probably the largest nerd and geek website in the world. And so uh, uh, everything's very exciting. But I also, the other day, was cool, seeing pack. And I was like, I accidentally forgot to enjoy little things at a time when little things are supposedly the thing that help. Uh, and I need to like step back and figure out what that is because like I work full time in tech and then I work full time producing podcasts and I realized like I sit at this desk for 17 hours a day and I don't get to do very many small things. Mm -hmm. Have you considered mm -hmm. a bird feeder? Uh, I have actually <laughs> considered a bird feeder. I do love the idea of it. Uh, uh, and I've I've also considered um, just adopting a raccoon because who doesn't love a trash pan? <laughs> Which are birds are so big. They, they, there's always a soap opera going on with them. Yes. Yeah, they're, I heard they're a, drama queens. I heard a huge bird crying one day, and I looked up, and there were all these little birds going after this huge bird. So I don't know you if the birds have like, gotten it. close to their eggs or whatever, but I mean, they were not playing. I mean, let that be no. a metaphor. No one scares me more than short people. <laughs> You know what? I wasn't expecting the direction of that, Ned. It really wasn't. <laughs> yeah. But before we move on, I do want to say that this makes total sense to me because birds are dinosaurs, man. They are. They birds are. Birds are dinosaurs. And that's fearsome. Mm -hmm. And on that note... Listen, I heard a whole NPR lecture about ducks and the size of their penises. They're corkscrews! Uh, I never knew the ducks had penises. I never knew that. Peeny. It's a shape peeny. thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I can't I like remember that. if 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 their their intercourse is quite aggressive and that, it is and that's why and so the the lady ducks um the 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 female duck um her her organs evolved to like make it more difficult there's something that yeah. I, is that what happened and then his and then the the male ducks evolved to have a corkscrew mechanism I don't you gotta get a bird expert on here. <laughs> this episode, this episode is titled <coughs> "Corkscrew Penis," and uh, we are playing Brooklyn Bowl. Okay. This is thank you. <laughs> Hello, Detroit. We are Corkscrew Penis. Um, uh, I don't want to read a play now. I want to talk about this. Um, we already read a play for the listeners. Uh, I'm bad at chronology. Let's have, let's hit pause on our recording. You've been listening to At The Table, a play reading series produced by Charging Moose Media. We are hosted by Rachel Flynn and Ned Donovan. Our artistic director and senior producer is Rachel Flynn. Editor is Ned Donovan. Associate producer is Megan Bagala. Music by Marcus Thorne Bagala. Thanks to our cast, Terry Burrell and Sam Tadaldi. To learn more about them, visit our website at chargingmoosemedia.com slash podcast. Be sure to listen to our playwright interview episode releasing next week. See you next time.